Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, Returning to Work Amid COVID-19, Regulations and Considerations for Employers. I'm John Kirk, President of Employee Benefits at CCIG. I'll be your host and moderator. It's our pleasure to have Ashley Jordan, Senior Counsel, Labor and Employment at Hush Blackwell as our speaker today, and also Javier Rivera, President of CCIG's Risk Management Group to contribute on Q&A. The objective of our presentation is twofold. One, briefly clarify final regulation points of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act and a little bit about the CARES Act as it relates to employment. Two, the bulk of our content, present essential return to work questions and considerations. Before we get started, three housekeeping items. All of our attendees are listening using your computer speaker system by default, so there's no need to mute yourself. That was done automatically. You'll have the opportunity to submit questions by typing, typing them into the chat panel on screen. Send your questions at any time, and we'll attempt to address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And thirdly, our presentation will be recorded. All content and contact information will be supplied post-webinar. A quick primer before Ashley begins. Our national battle with COVID-19 has created profound disruption in our personal and work lives in the past seven weeks. In short time, government has responded with overarching regulations in which to comply, add heightened employee safety to the front and center, all resulting in a build the plan as we fly it playbook as we plan a return to work in a new normal. In the coming weeks, as Colorado and other regions shift to safer at home, employers like you will ultimately make the decision about how and when to bring back your, work, your workers safely to the office, shop, restaurant, or showroom. We recognize there are far more questions than answers today, but leaders must lead in this time without definition, and planning must begin where perfection is the enemy of good. The new playbook for reopening a workplace during a pandemic might range wildly in OSHA and ADA compliance, from physical policies, say hello to the new six-foot office, to new workplace traffic patterns, to temperature checks for coronavirus symptoms. Government guidance is just that and leaves much of the planning and key actions up to you as employers. And we're here to help. I'll close my comments with empathy for all our employees that will be returning. Physical workplace protocols check numerous boxes. However, they do not address the most essential aspect of return to work, the individual human factor, and our physical, emotional, and psychological readiness. Some employees will be clamoring to come back to work, and conversely, many will be worried about their personal health and the health of others. They'll have anxiety about their jobs, their finances, their families. This period has been an incredibly stressful time. Your leadership presence, multi-channel communication is paramount for success. And as I heard a phrase this week for us all to model, communicate for competence. I'd now like to introduce Ashley Jordan, Senior Counsel and a Labor and Employment Expert at Hush Blackwell. Ashley, take it away. Thank you, John, and good morning, everyone. Um, as John mentioned, I'm an employment attorney, and just like you, I'm sure, my entire work life lately has been permeated by all things COVID-19. I have been assisting companies nonstop, it seems like, for the last four to five weeks on how COVID-19 affects employment-related decisions, and it's apparent that there's a lot of confusion out there and a lot of help is needed. So I'm happy to be here today to try to help you through um, some of the hurdles. I'm hoping that today I can help you understand more about what you need to be aware of in terms of the law and also what you need to be thinking about going forward. With some issues, the answers are pretty clear cut and that makes it easier for all of us. But not surprisingly, there are a lot of gray areas and moving parts. And frankly, every time the Department of Labor, the EEOC, the IRS, or another agency issues clarifying regulations or answers to frequently asked questions, I'm so happy to get that information, but then I always want more. I think about all the questions that are still unanswered and the new ones that have cropped up. With the stay-at-home orders being addressed more and more, even in just the last couple of days, I do expect that there will be more guidance coming out to help us navigate these issues related returning to work. What I've tried to do is tailor a fairly short but very content-filled presentation that will remind you of the rules already enacted as well as to think about the next steps. As I mentioned, this is a fluid situation and more regs will be coming out. 
but I think it's safe to say that we all know that certain things are definitely going to be addressed in the regulations, and we might as well go ahead and start thinking about those next steps now so that you're fully prepared for a come back to work scenario. I apologize, I'm trying to move to the next slide and there we go, okay. All right, so sorry about that. Um, what I wanted to start with is the FFCRA and I don't wanna go into too much detail about it because I'm assuming that you've heard about it. it. It all came to the forefront of our minds in March and it became effective on April 1st. I'm assuming that most of you know about it in a broad sense, but I do think it's important to go through some of the content. And really what I wanna do is share some of the trickier issues that I've been communicating about with companies that I've been helping. Um, just at the outset, I wanna remind you that this act applies to employers with under 500 employees. So there are two prongs. The first is the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act commonly referred to as Emergency FMLA Act. And as you can guess, it allows for a potentially long leave, but only for a very narrow reason, and that's for leave related to school closures or daycare providers. And the second is the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, which is a fairly short two-week paid leave, but it, has to re it relates to certain COVID-19 related absences. So I am gonna talk about them separately, but I wanna be clear because this question comes up all the time. It is possible that an employee could potentially take advantage of both of these leaves. So the Emergency FMLA Expansion Act, uh, briefly wanna go into a few of the nuances with it. It allows for 12 weeks of leave, but only for a narrow reason. And that's if the employee can't come into work because their child's school or place of care has closed due to COVID-19. Um, there's a caveat with the amount of work that the employee has to have been employed by, and that was that's at least 30 calendar days. Um, I get a lot of questions because there's confusion about whether this leave is paid, and it's it's paid for part of the time and unpaid for part of the time. So the first two weeks is unpaid, and then the next 10 weeks are paid. Um, however, if the employee has something like vacation time or PTO, and the employee wants to use that for the first two weeks, they can, but the employer can't require the substitution of paid leave if the employee wants to save that vacation time for later. After the first two weeks, uh, it is paid leave, but it's not full pay, it's a percentage. It's two thirds regular rate of pay after the first 10 days off, but there is a cap of $200 a day or $10,000 in the aggregate. Now, following the leave, the employee is entitled to return to the same or equivalent position as a general rule. However, if the employer has less than 25 employees, this is not guaranteed. There's some nuances that I've seen come up with this act. Um, the Emergency FMLA Expansion Act does not replace traditional FMLA. I'm sure you all know regular FMLA is still available to employees and it has the stricter requirements. The employee has to work for the employer for 12 months, has to work 1,250 hours um, in the calendar year prior, and has to have the employer has to have 50 employees in a 75 mile radius. So the regular FMLA and the emergency FMLA, they run concurrently, not consecutively. So what that means is if an employee has already taken off some time in the benefit year that's been approved and used as FMLA leave, that counts against the 12 weeks of the Emergency FMLA Act. Uh, the employee does not get 24 weeks of protected leave. Additionally, after this act came out, the IRS issued guidance stating that only one caretaker can take advantage of the Emergency FMLA Act for a particular child. So that means if you have two employees, two parents who are employees that um, have employers under 500, um, both parents can't take advantage of this and both parents can't stay at home and care for the child. Only one parent would need to take care of the child. 
And you also, as an employee, would have to show special circumstances on why there would need to be parent supervision at home during daylight hours if your child is over 14. So if you have the 18-year-old teenager at home, um, it's assumed that that teenager can take care of himself or herself and that you can go to work. There obviously would be some kind of exception if it's a special needs child. Um, and very important, if the employer does permit telecommuting, then the employee is likely not eligible for this leave. It's really only available to employees who cannot work. I wanna turn now to the Emergency pay, Paid Sick Leave Act. It's, it's a little more complicated and there's, there's a little bit more content to it. Um, unlike the Emergency FMLA Act, there's no minimum amount of time that the employee has to be, have been part of your workforce for this leave to apply. Uh, an employer cannot interfere with this paid leave by requiring the employee to use other forms of paid leave first. And this leave is in addition to anything that the employer already provides. Uh, the leave is for two weeks based on the employee's average hours and it must be used uh, for COVID-19 reasons. And just to eliminate any confusion, there's six specific situations that have been laid out um, just detailing when the employee is able to take this leave. So this slide details the six reasons. Um, I'm not gonna read through them one by one, but I'm gonna group them together. The first three are specific to the employee. So the employee is part of a quarantine order or has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine, or the employee has COVID-19 symptoms and is seeking a medical diagnosis. Um, and then reasons four through six um, include an employee caring for an individual who's under quarantine, or caring for a child whose school or daycare is closed. Um, and then there's kind of a catch-all at number six of a substantially similar condition. A few nuances with this act. If the reason evaporates, the leave is no longer available. So what do I mean by that? Um, I'm talking about if a quarantine is lifted or if an employee takes a test for COVID-19 and it comes back negative, um, or if your child's daycare opens back up, then the availability of the leave will end. If the employment relationship ends for whatever reason, the employer doesn't have to pay out the remaining leave. So it isn't something that's owed to the departing employee. And also the leave is good through the end of this year. It doesn't carry over to next year. Um, significantly, there is a notice that has to be posted in the workplace about this leave. It's on the DOL website, Department of Labor website. Um, make sure that you have this posting up um, if you haven't put it up already. I know some of you may not have um, people in your workplace, and so the poster may not really seem applicable, but you need to, you are required to have it up. And since there is going to be some return to work, um, sooner rather than later, it's a good idea to go ahead and get that up as it is a requirement. Uh, the next slide is just a chart for you to be able to see visually um, what the pay structure is for this, this leave. Um, you may recall a couple of slides ago, I kind of grouped the six reasons into two categories. So the first three reasons, um, if the employee is out for one of them, then they are paid for the two weeks at their regular rate of pay. Now there is a cap of $511 per day and $5,110 in the aggregate. And then if it's for reasons four through six, then it's two thirds regular rate of pay with a cap of $200 per day and $2,000 in the aggregate. Now you might be wondering, is it possible for an employee to be eligible to take advantage of both acts meaning that the employee is either paid in full or at a rate of two-thirds pay for the first two weeks by the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, and then paid at a two-thirds rate for the following 10 weeks? And the answer is yes, um, although they're subject to the cap set forth by each of these acts. However, the only way that these two can work together in that kind of situation is if the employee cannot work due to caring for a child whose school or daycare is closed, because that's the only common reason 
um, that's relatable to both acts. Uh, the next three slides are a flow chart um, that, has, that my firm has prepared to help our clients navigate through these issues. Um, I'm not going to go through them um, because I've covered quite a bit of the content already, and this is really just another way to um, look at these issues. What I think would be helpful to you is um, looking through them if you have an employee who is um, stating that they need to take a leave, and you can go through them and literally go question by question using this flow chart as a tool to think about is the FFCRA even at play in this scenario? And if so, which or are both of the leaves possibilities? So you'll see the second page of the flow chart is specifically tailored to the Paid Sick Leave Act. And then the third one is for the child care leave. Um, hopefully those will be helpful to you. It's, it's my understanding um, from what John said at the beginning that um, the, the entire presentation, but including this flow chart will be available to you. Um, I, I believe it's going to be sent to you tomorrow, so you don't need to try to frantically write down things right now, but um, you'll have this as a resource, um, and I think it'll be pretty useful. I, I consult it all the time. I, I find it very helpful. Okay, so you might be asking, wow, this is a lot of help that employees are getting. What about me, the employer? Is there anything that can help me with paying for all these leaves? And hopefully you already know the answer to this, but just in case, let me go ahead and spill the beans. The answer is yes, there is a tax benefit for you. But I wanna make sure that you're putting yourself in the best possible place to get the tax credit in order, and in order to do that, you really have to have the proper documentation. So if you haven't already prepared it, that's something that you wanna go ahead and do now. You have to have a separate form of, for each type of leave, and it specifically needs to be certified by the employee. Um, and the employee needs to be um, certifying enough information to show that the leave is necessary and consistent with one of the reasons specified in the FFCRA. So you wanna get that leave form signed, filled out by the employee, you wanna keep it in your files, and then you will um, be able to use that to get a tax credit. I'm going to change gears a little bit. I know I've given you a lot to digest, probably feels like a tornado just hit you, um, but I do wanna talk about unemployment benefits um, for a minute. Um, unemployment does not come into play if there is work. It doesn't come into play if the employee can telecommute. It really comes into play if you are in the situation where you need to initiate a furlough or a layoff. And in that case, the employees should be applying for unemployment. So just as a reminder, in Colorado, an employee can file for and receive up to 26 weeks of unemployment. And so the CARES Act is giving an extra benefit. The CARES Act is federal legislation that just went into effect a few weeks ago. Um, it stands for the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. And it covers all kinds of things, a lot more than unemployment. But I'm just bringing up that one section of the CARES Act because I want to make sure that you know that an individual under the CARES Act can receive an additional 13 weeks of benefits on top of whatever the state offers. So in Colorado, if you, you can get up to 26 weeks of benefits of unemployment um, in this state. And then when you add the CARES Act benefit on top of that, that means that an employee who's been laid off or furloughed can possibly get up to 39 weeks of benefits. The CARES Act also provides for a flat $600 additional weekly benefit on top of whatever the state provides. And that's for up to four months. Um, and so it's kind of interesting because as it stands now, it's actually possible that an employee could potentially make more money with unemployment than their regular rate of pay. Um, I'm assuming that this will be addressed at some point uh, because I don't think that's the intent, 
but for right now, that's actually um, a possibility. Additionally, under CARES, the waiting period that's typically in effect, um, which is one week, that has been waived um, as far as unemployment benefits go. And um, I just bring this up because all these benefits do create incentives um, for furloughed or terminated employees to file unemployment. I know that we've all heard of, you know, the long lines or, you know, the phone lines, the waiting time on the phone or, you know, the internet uh, and um, unemployment sites crashing, but it is worth it for the employees to file for those benefits. And I think it's important for you as the employers to know that there are some extra benefits being offered. Um, and if you do find yourself in the difficult situation of needing to lay off or furlough an employee, I would definitely um, encourage them to, um, to apply for the benefits. Now, I'm, I'm sure that you all are, are well versed with your EEOC laws, and as you can imagine, um, all of these COVID-19 issues have raised a lot of questions that also touch on EEOC matters. You know, on the one hand, we have a national pandemic that has everybody on high alert with safety and health issues in the workplace, but then you still have all your EEOC discrimination laws that need to be followed. Um, the EOC's website has a new section devoted to COVID-19, and it's, it's listed here on the slide. I have found it to be very helpful. Um, I'll also let you know that one of the links on the EOC's website is to a webinar that the EOC hosted a few weeks ago that answered a lot of questions that employers were grappling with. Um, I listened to it. I found it really helpful. Some of the topics um, that were covered were disability inquiries and medical exams confidentiality of medical information, ADA obligations, and job modifications and reasonable accommodations. Um, I think that we're gonna talk about some of those here. I, I cannot, in a short amount of time, go through all of the ones that I thought would be, potentially be applicable to you all or, or just interesting things for you all to think about, but I'm gonna try to highlight a few of them. And if we have time in the question and answer section, I can definitely bring up some additional ones. But if, if you do have an employee that's um, bringing up such things as disability um, issues or reasonable accommodation questions or um, things of that matter, this is actually a very good resource. And it's in a, um, a bunch of it is in a question and answer format. And you just might find the question that you're needing to have, have the answer to listed um, on the website uh, with the answer right there. <clears throat> so of all the discrimination laws, the ADA is going to come up the most uh, with COVID-19. And like I said, I could spend a whole day talking about these. But I think that um, one takeaway for you all is that as long as you have policies that apply to the entire workforce, or at least entire groups of the workforce, and you aren't singling people out, um, you can continue to take steps to address the COVID-19 issues. For example, you can take employees' temperature at the workplace. And frankly, with return to work happening sooner rather than later, you're probably going to be doing that and need to be doing that. Um, I often get asked, can you, can you, or can I, as an employer, ask an employee if they have COVID-19? And my answer is, you shouldn't ask that specific question, but the EEOC does say that you can ask about specific symptoms, which really gets you to the same place. Um, you can send an employee home if they're displaying COVID-19 symptoms. I do get that question a lot. Um, it's never okay to broadcast the name of someone who has disclosed they have it. Even if they say, it's fine, you can tell everyone that I tested positive. I would not do that. Um, especially in smaller workplaces, sometimes it becomes obvious if um, there's talk about, you know, people needing to become aware that they may have been exposed in the workplace and there's only one person absent. It, it becomes pretty obvious who the person is that, that has the COVID-19. And you could have employees coming to you saying, I know so-and-so has it, um, it's obvious. And I would just stress to you that you need to um, stick to your standard policy, which is, you know, me, the employer, cannot discuss uh, medical information with other employees and, you know, their privacy laws at, at, um, in place, and I really can't comment on that. 
So we're kind of at the end of this section here, um, this first part of the presentation. Um, and I kind of wanted to end with a checklist or maybe some bullet points for it, what my advice to you would be for right now. Um, I think it's really important to have somebody or, or a group, um, and it may be a group because it's a lot of work for one person, who's really dedicated to staying up to date on national, state, and local regulations and guidance from agencies. Um, I have a lot of clients who use me for that purpose, but honestly, an attorney is not required. <clears throat> um, it could be somebody internal or a group. Above all, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, communication is key. Uh, this is a time where more communication is better than less. I would be really transparent. And if you're struggling, and I'm assuming everybody who's on this webinar is struggling to some degree, um, be honest with your employees. Now that we've been going at this for a while, I, I think it would actually be pretty odd and definitely unadvisable for an employee to be completely blindsided with a furlough or a layoff or drastic reduction in hours and so on. I think it's better to keep employees in the loop um, so that there aren't big surprises like that. And I think it's just really important to send a message to employees that you want them to know that you care and that you're doing your best and that these are difficult times um, and that you're working hard to address all of the issues that need to be um, considered. <clears throat> if an employee does come to you and has some kind of request related to COVID-19, whether it be a reasonable accommodation question or something else, I'd urge you to listen and then engage interactively. So for example, I get a lot of questions from clients saying that they have an employee who's approached them and said, you know, I really don't want to come to work. I'm scared to come to work. But they don't really have a reason not to come to work other than a general fear that isn't tied to a particular threat. And in many of those cases, the answer to the employee is, you know, I really need you to come to work. I mean, honestly, the employee in a lot of situations there they don't get to choose not to come to work if there is work to do, and if they don't fall in one of the categories listed in the leaves that I've talked about earlier. But it, you could message it in a way that's more friendly. You could urge um, you could urge the employee to talk more about well, what is it that you're scared about, um, and then ask ask yourself or ask your leadership group: Can we be flexible here? Could we maybe have this employee telecommute? Is it possible to let this employee choose to take an unpaid leave of absence? Um, these are all possibilities, and they do come with a caveat. If you start making an exception or kind of going against the grain with one employee, you have to be prepared to do it for other employees who may have the same request. So you want to make sure that discrimination complaints won't be substantiated in that situation. But I think it's really important to have that interactive dialogue. It can really go a long way. If your employee informs you that he or she needs to take a leave um, that would be covered by the FFCRA, make sure you get the required documents from the employee. We talked about this earlier, and I just can't stress it enough that it's really important to have those in place now so that you have them ready if the employee asks um, for that leave. You can request um, documentation from a medical provider um, if the employee was out sick, and I would also urge you to add that to your documentation list if it's not something that you automatically do. If you find yourself having to lay off or furlough an employee, help the employee by, by reminding them that there may be unemployment benefits available. Don't guarantee the benefits because that's not your role um, and, and you can't promise them that, but do urge them to apply and to do so immediately. Um, I want to bring up the WARN Act as one fi final bullet point here. I'm not sure that the WARN Act would apply to any of you, but I just want to bring it up. Um, if there is going to be a closure of less than six months, then the WARN Act wouldn't apply. But it's hard to know. How long would you possibly have your workplace closed? If it could be more than six months, then arguably the WARN Act could be at play. Um, I would just let, let you know that if you are going to do some kind of mass layoff or some type of uh, work site closure that the WARN Act is out there and you at least want to 
find out what the requirements are and if you think that you might need to talk to somebody to to um, adhere to the requirements, which in, in a nutshell are, are notice requirements to the employees and there's very specific language that you have to use. So that is kind of the first part of this presentation. Um, it was kind of a look back about what's already in place, but these, for example, these leaves are gonna keep probably being asked for and requested. And so I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows what is involved with them and that they're still at play through the end of this year. Um, but I do want to, looking at the time, I want to keep moving forward. Um, I really want to spend the rest of the, the presentation talking about reopening for business, because I know that that's probably an area where you have a lot of questions and could use a lot of advice. Um, I will say at the outset, there aren't a lot of regulations, but I say that um, with a yet attached to it. I, I really expect that to change, and I think it's going to change very soon. It could literally be any day now. Um, we're already starting to see some written documents um, that some companies are starting to adopt, and we're starting to see some guidance that other states and other locales are uh, um, using. We haven't seen anything per se. Um, for the state of Colorado, but there have been discussions about it. And so we're gonna focus on that now. All right, thank you, Ashley. We're gonna give her a little break, a uh, little water break. Um, in this section break, we'd like to take a moment or two to share a quick poll with everyone on your workplace readiness plan. Um, please select the appropriate response and click submit. We're gonna try to do this live while, while Ashley kind of transitions to the next stage. Um, There's collecting responses now. Go. Okay. Thank you for that. Just a little break in the action. Um, so I'm seeing that 12% of you are very confident. Um, about half of you are somewhat confident. 31% are unsure, and there's about 12% that are either not at all confident or not very confident. And that's probably what I would guess. Um, so the vast majority of you, it sounds like, at least would have questions about it. Um, there's some that feel very confident, but um, there's a lot to talk about here. And it, there's gonna be a lot for you to talk about internally at your workplace. So I wanna at least give you topics to be considering while we're waiting for more detailed regs to come out. And Ashley, a quick time check. We have 10 minutes remaining on our, our, on our scheduled time. We may go over a few minutes based on our Q&A. We have about 20 questions um, thus far. So uh, hang with us as we continue through this uh, next stage. Okay. So we may not know a lot about what the future looks like, but at a minimum, I think we all know that it's going to involve social distancing. So handshakes are out, hugs are definitely out. Uh, many workstations are open and designed to intentionally promote interaction among employees, but right now that's very problematic. Um, this is just not something that can be avoided and we're all gonna have to have rules for our workplaces on these issues. I anticipate the CDC and perhaps OSHA to issue some guidance on these topics, but right now I wanted to give you some things to start brainstorming about. So in addition to, to kind of social distancing as a whole, what does that look like in terms of where people work in your physical space? How are you gonna handle meetings? Um, frankly, some of these issues are a little more clear cut 
in terms of what you can do. I mean, you can have people telework, you can stagger shifts, you can space people out where they work, you can have virtual only meetings. But before the worksite is open, you wanna be providing details to employees about when they're expected to work and where, when and where they are expected to be um, working in the worksite and then when they are expected to be available. There's also the whole question of health screening. And yes, I am talking about taking temperature at work. Someone's gonna have to be trained to do it and they're gonna have to know what the ranges are to be concerned about. And then there's the reporting aspect, whether it's by the person taking the temperature or an employee self-reporting about COVID symptoms and or possible exposure. Um, questions I'd be asking are to whom should the employees report? What's the plan from there to inform others who may have been in contact without revealing the employee's name? Sanitizing the workplace is gonna take on a whole new look. How often should that be happening? With what materials? What do we do about the reception areas, the elevators, the stairways? What about guests coming back to work or guests coming to the workplace, including delivery people? What do we do about break rooms? There are also questions about employees taking public crowded transportation to work. Do you maybe want to suggest alternatives? Or if, if you don't, do you implement requirements that employees must follow if they are going to use public transportation, such as face masks? These are all hard questions and they're complicated and they're going to take time to um, delve into. Um, but I think the important thing is to communicate with your employees. You're going to do that to manage their anxiety. You want to engage them. You want to get feedback from them. And above all, you want to be really clear about what you expect from each of them. So day one. You want to think about this before day one, and you want to communicate it before day one. You don't want everyone coming in at this exact same time into one front door. You don't want there to be a line at the entrance. You want to know ahead of time what you're going to do about temperature taking. Uh, you want to let people know um, in some kind of policy what's going to happen with vending machines, the, the fridge in the break room, the coffee maker, filling up water bottles. I think having snacks out for everyone to enjoy is going to be a thing of the past. Um, do you wanna make changes to your workstations and have some kind of um, changes there? You wanna let people know what to expect. It will manage anxiety um, about them coming back to work because frankly, a lot of them may be nervous about um, getting out of uh, the situation where they've been at home kind of cooped up where they know everyone that's there and where everyone has been. Once they come back to work, they're gonna be around many other people um, and potentially exposed. So importantly also, you wanna ask who's my contact person gonna be for these inevitable questions that arise? Um, probably somebody in HR, if you have an HR department, probably not immediate supervisors. Um, the reason I say that is you want consistency in your answers. So you don't wanna to designate too many people. Um, you also wanna make sure that this person who's been informed by employees, if they realize that they've been exposed to COVID-19 or if they have symptoms, or they test positive, is the same person answering some of the questions. Um, that person is kind of the holder of all the information and they can be responsible for contacting others who came in contact with the infected employee. You may be thinking, okay, so how would I communicate? Um, I think the overarching theme is over communication is not gonna be a problem these days. You want communications to be frequent, you want to involve your employees. You want to ask for their feedback or su suggestions where appropriate. Maybe you can conduct demonstrations and training to introduce new skills to staff. Um, I'd use email. I would use video messaging. I'd use virtual live events, posters, digital displays, um, also changes to your employee handbook that you disseminate. I, and also just make sure that your employees know who to go to for help and support whether it's about COVID-19 issues in particular, or about how their work um, responsibilities may have changed or the work, workspace, um, physical space has changed. And I just wanna kind of briefly bring up a few additional concerns that may not be on your radar. Now's a really good time to make sure that your policies are up to date um, and that they address these current concerns. 
Above all, you really want to make sure that the policies put an obligation on the employee to follow the guidelines. And so you want to make sure that you have in writing the employee expectations. One reason is that it's going to force you to actually have a policy and it will make sure that you're addressing what needs to be addressed. Another is that it will be evidence that you had a policy should that ever be questioned. If there's a problem and you do have a COVID outbreak in your workplace, you want to show that you had a policy and that you followed it to the best of your ability. And more than that, you also just want to have a policy to serve as a roadmap for your employees to follow. You want to be really clear on what you expect with regards to social distancing and what the responsibilities are going to be about health screening and reporting and travel and more. I can't stress enough that it is imperative to adopt these written policies. If you have people telework, you want to have policies at that. Um, you want to be telling non-exempt employees in writing so that you're not um, running afoul of wage and hour laws, that they can only work their designated shifts so you don't run afoul of the wage and hour laws. You want to address technology issues. What parameters have you set about for data privacy and security now that somebody is working out of their home? Um, I think we all know there's more risk with working at home with respect to data privacy, and even more so if the employee is using a personal computer. You no longer have control over their use of protection software. Um, what training are you offering to inform employees of the increasing number of cyber criminals out there? If you have an employee handbook, I'd say this is a good time to review it and make changes to it and add to it um, to address some of these newer issues. If you don't have a handbook, this would be the time to come up with one. If you don't want to have a handbook per se, at a minimum, have some written policies to address some of these issues that we've talked about. I know I haven't left a lot of time for questions, um, but that's kind of the end of the formal presentation, and I do want to try to have us um, answer a few. Absolutely. Thank you, Ashley. Um, we're going to now begin answering a few of the questions submitted during the presentation. Um, I'm going to improvise a little bit because we are at our allotted time. We're going to go a little bit longer um, and have Ashley answer a few of the questions that I believe are within the realm of, of the presentation. Um, will you just give us a quick second to transition so that she can read some of the questions? Um, I'm, I'm just going to pick a few. Um, I saw a question asking if there's a place um, on the um, internet to get the leave forms. I have not seen that. I know that I have prepared those for clients, um, but there's not something that's um, public um, that you can use as a guide from what I have seen so far. Um, I'm also seeing a question about whether an employee has to actually reference the FSCRA in order to get that leave? And the answer is no. It's kind of like when someone comes to you and says, you know, I just had surgery and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to um, work the same way that I did. What they're basically asking you is for a reasonable accommodation, but they don't need to use those words in order for you to start engaging in that process. And it's the same here. Um, you don't want to play lawyer on them and say, oh, just because you didn't reference that exact act, you don't get the leave. Um, in good faith, if somebody is giving you a scenario that falls under that act, then you should be um, talking to them about these benefits that are available to them. Um, the paid leave, um, there's a question about who pays for that. The employer does pay for that. But, and not the, not a governmental agency, that was another question. It's not a governmental agency that's paying the employee. The employer pays it. What, what the employer um, can get in terms of relief, though, is a tax credit. The poster that is required to be put up is available on the Department of Labor website. So if you just Google Department of Labor um, FFCRA poster, um, that will pop up.
Um, this is actually um, a, a question that I've gotten um, before, and I think I think it it could come into play, um, and I'm seeing it here um, for you all. It, the question is, what if you allow telecommuting, but someone has a special needs child at home? So as a general rule, if you have work for an employee and you offer telecommuting, then they shouldn't be taking this leave. However, if, if the special needs child, um, either school or provider, uh, child care provider is not open, then I believe the best way to read that is that that person cannot telecommute um, because they need to take care of their child. So have them fill out the form, certify that they are the caregiver for that child, and that because of the situation that they can't work. In that case, um, then they would be entitled to the FFCRA leave. Will these slides be sent out after the call? Yes. Um, and I think that's essential because I know I've bombarded you with a lot of information and I think that um, it might be helpful to go back and look at some of them, especially some of the slides that were really heavy on the content. Tell me if I'm running out of time, John. I could keep going all day, but I, I know that everybody has other things that they need to be doing. Let's answer uh, one or two more. Okay. And um, improvising again, um, maybe as a team, we will, um, record all the questions that have been answered, or excuse me, presented, and we will do our best to answer them and send them in with our uh, documents that will come in an email to you tomorrow with the recorded presentation and Ashley's content. Sound good? Yeah, so let me... Um, Let's go with one more. Yeah, so what might the protocol be if a returned employee tests positive for the virus and has worked with other employees in the workplace? I assume they all have to self-quarantine. And the answer would be yes, um, you are correct. Um, if an employee um, is ha has tested positive, then really as the employer, you have the obligation to make sure that others who may have come in contact with them um, are at home. So maybe they can telework um, and keep working from home. And if their job doesn't lend itself to that, then that employee who's been exposed, they would fall under the Paid Sick Leave Act um, and get pay for two weeks while they're self-quarantined. Terrific. All right. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Hush Blackwell. And thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. Excellent content and appreciate everyone's attention. If you have any other questions, please contact uh, either Ashley Jordan or me. We'll be sending a follow-up email with our contact information. And again, I repeat, the slides will be sent out. This webinar has been recorded and we'll do our best to send out the questions that are presented and the answers to them. On behalf again of Ashley Hush Blackwell and CCIG, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.